Good morning. Good morning. Um, we have got a title for this morning, which is... On our auto queue. Uh, True freedom resides within. Um, and we will be speaking to that. We have about an hour and a half before break. So we just thought for the first um, sort of 20 minutes, it would be really nice. We're not looking for questions at the moment. We've got a, a time in the afternoon for questions. Um, but we just wanted to hear from people if they've seen anything or experienced anything different or if anything kind of stood out to them yesterday or like an aha moment. Um, just to share that now. Um, and the reason we were saying we're going to leave questions to the afternoon is so often throughout the day questions get answered. We answer them ourselves. But there will be a time later on if people still have it on their mind and it's a burning question that they can ask. Yeah, please feel free to do so. But this morning, it'd just be really nice to hear from people their experience of yesterday. Uh, if anything, if you don't know how to unmute yourself, you can just put your hand up, and we'll try and do that for you. Mother. I'd just like to say how good it is to be reminded in these sessions that you do the true basics of, of the three principles just to bring it back to that simplicity that pure pure spirit that resides in everybody and sometimes we lose that but reinforcing it in these in these little and I've been around the principles for perhaps as long as you have Dave now <laughs> and does help to be reminded all the time of going back to source because we make up stories all the way around it but at its essence it's the pure pure love of everything beautiful man beautiful love catherine catherine Just a bit of a light bulb moment for me yesterday. Where just I, lean forward a bit, love. Okay. It was just a bit of a light bulb moment for me yesterday when, Jen, you just said something about when uh, Sid was talking to anyone or when people that you're talking to people, you talk to you rather than the person that you think you are. So that just struck a chord with me a little bit of rather than speaking to your ego you i take it as rather than listening to something through your ego listen to how you feel it is inside how are you getting what i'm saying <laughs> with that so it was just that that struck a chord with me a little bit when you said that listen that like i feel that you, when you're talking to us you're talking to us as we're meant to be rather than our ego does that make sense it really does it's a tricky thing i feel like i'm listening to you from inside rather than what catherine the self-employed woman thinks i feel like i'm listening not like like sid says don't listen listen and i feel like i'm listening another, i'm just making a couple of notes of things that people are saying that we can bring them back up yeah it's lovely thank you catherine thanks catherine love i think that's one of the things i always remember on every every training i've ever attended has been this idea that what happens if we can listen beyond the story or, or listen beyond what the person presents and that that could be with working with someone or whether it's in conversation in a group we we we're very quick to look at the form or how something's showing up and i think when we can look beyond that like i know when my sister does stuff in, and my dad does stuff with kids with the principals they just they said it's been such a gift in a classroom to see beyond the the behaviors that show up um, and just speak to the the health and the, the wisdom that resides within and he said the more you speak to that the more you get that back um, but it's very easy to want to react to the behaviour. So it's, it is a very different way of listening. And I think also it's a different way of hearing. 
that when people then speak back to us, we, can, we, we hear different. Beautiful, thank you. Thanks, Catherine. I'll jump in then. I had a couple of fun moments yesterday. Um, <coughs> I, uh, um, when you were sharing early on, Jenny, I kind of looked back and saw how insecure I used to be. Um, now I talk to hundreds or thousands of people in my job in IT, which is incredibly dull, but it uh, <laughs> pays the bills. Um, but I would never have done that, you know, years and years ago. Um, I used to hate this stuff. And in fact, you know, still on this type of thing, I still think, oh, do I want to unmute myself? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's so funny. But I saw yesterday that um, it wasn't me that had changed. All that had changed was my thinking about talking in front of people. Um, and it, it was just like, oh, and it helps. <laughs> That's a, that's a bit of a change. Um, it's very cool. But then at the same time, I managed to, my ego showed up for most of the day yesterday. And uh, it took me till Dickin was speaking to kind of settle into the feeling and start listening, which was, uh, which amused me no end. But uh, yeah, it's a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That is why we do it over three days. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> It is that, you know, day one, people often come with very busy minds and like, um, we're just saying, um, we're ca go on, how, how do you pronounce it again? Ca 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 I'm going to unmute you one second, look, ask to unmute. Yeah, yeah say it again. Uh, Khadija. Khadija. Or TG. TG, that's it, TG. I'm going to write that down because I, yeah, we had a conversation last night and one of the things we said was, you know, when you're listening to this, it's really easy to listen to our, I've got this problem. I want this problem fixing. Now, I'm going to listen to this through, I'm going to, I'm going to wait for the answer to my problem. Are they going to bring it up? Are they even going to come close to talking about it? And you realise the busyness of mind that we're sat in in that moment that cannot just sit there and listen. And uh, I love I love what KG said when um, TG TG <laughs> TG said um, when you said that just just before everybody came on and there were some people who were there who were still on the screen just as we came on like and TG said she was sat there listening to the um, first recording we put out last night because TG wasn't even aware this was on yesterday um, but you said you were listening through when when's it going to get to this and then we did mention. At some point you know don't listen to this trying to fix a problem this isn't about fixing a problem if you fix them uh, if you fix this massive misunderstanding as to the nature of life and reality your problem will fix itself the problems are consequent so yeah no that was that was beautiful when you said that love I love what you said um, a minute ago, Austin, about should I unmute, should I unmute? Because for the first few years being around the principles, I'd had such a shift, but I still wasn't going to be speaking in front of groups of people. And I used to sometimes sit there in my seat and I'd kind of be getting this feeling of like, I'd really have something to say. And and I always kind of thought, oh no, I can't, I can't share from this space. It's, I'm too anxious. And then I remember just thinking, well, actually, there's something that really wants to come out. There's something you really want to say. And I think that's why the feeling's getting so intense, just speak. And it took me a while, but then when I did start sharing, and, and you realise how, how many other people have that same experience. But when we're in it, it feels like it's just us that feels like that. And it's so nice to sort of go, like, despite that feeling, still share. And like I've said, there's been so many times when we've done events where I'm still in that just as we're starting. And at some point I fall off my mind and I get into the day and it's not an issue anymore. But it's such a common thing. And I think it's nice when people share about it because it can feel like we're the only ones that feel like it.
So I was going to read what Kendra put. <clears throat> I like what Dave's mum said about being reminded of this. I get so wrapped up in everything throughout my life and I forget sometimes that it's all in my mind. Last night, I was able to just sit and be the observer. I didn't get involved in my thoughts too much. Just let them pass as if they were traffic. I watched something interesting last night with Muji and he said something that stuck with me also. He said something along the lines of, you must jump like the cow jumped over the moon. The moon being our thoughts and ego. Rise above it. And Sarah said, like Austin, I was sitting wondering whether to unmute. And Dave's mum said almost exactly what I wanted to say. So thank you both, Austin and Dave's mum. Dave's mum's name is Margaret or Margie Moo. <laughs> I remember my dad saying, because I'd been around the principals about nine or, nine or ten months when he then got interested and came into the community, but he'd often get referred to as Jenny's dad. And he's like, I do, I do have a name. My, my name's Peter. <laughs> She's lucky he was called Jenny's dad, isn't he? <laughs> So, I, I was um, really touched yesterday, um, Jenny and Dave, um, particularly when you were talking around beliefs. And I've I've had a really bad two weeks, like this this last fortnight, and so grumpy to be around. <laughs> and of course, Bernie ignored every every single thing and kept saying, shall we go out for walks? Shall we do this? Shall we do that? You're cooking tonight. It just completely ignored any grumpiness. And um, I just couldn't shift it. I just couldn't shift it. And I don't know if it, it, it was yesterday, but it almost kind of I popped out of whatever was going on. And um, the kind of noticing that I did was, as you know, I do a lot of community work. Yeah, lots. And in the lockdown, I've, I've physically been locked down in Norfolk, not not up north. All right. Not 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 with my gang, you see. And um, sorry. Not in God's own country. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And. Um, um, my head's been messing with me about how to work with, with um, my gang, so to speak. And um, I've done some bits and pieces, but I've just got, completely got in my own way about it. And some of it was about sharing the love virtually. So how, how are we doing here on, on this event? And... Um, I don't know, it was, it, it was just interesting and in that there was something up there as well about being visible on, online, which is crazy. And it's like, yeah, I just, I just noticed how much grief I was giving myself. And it's so sneaky. Yeah. You know, yeah. somebody mentioned stuff about blind spots, but it, it's been so sneaky. And the only thing that kept me going through it was I remember Dickin telling me once, that he'd gone into the Pransky's office and George was laying on the settee, George Pransky, and, and Dickon had said, can I help you? And George was like, no, I'm just feeling that way out. And he kind of was like that over a couple of days and it's that trust of another person to know that you'll get out of it as well. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, like Bernie's my, my only community at the moment on one level. So having the trust of somebody beside me to know that this will just pass and that I'm all right anyway, has really helped. And to trust myself as well. That's, I think that's, that's good. Yeah. 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 So thank you. Oh, thank you. you're welcome. Well, thank you for all the people who work you. That's, that's It'll continue. You know, I think this is it. We, 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 we always say this, 
the principles are not an anesthetic to life. It's not about anaesthetizing ourselves to feelings and to experiences. It's about fully embracing living and life in its wholeness, in its entirety, in its complexity, in its simplicity. It's, it's understanding we are built to be here. We're meant to be here. We're supposed to be here. We're capable of being here. There's nothing we cannot deal with. We just, we just get scared. One of the things that popped me out of it as well was we were on a walk this week and I, honestly I could have broke down in tears, it filled my heart so much, but there were snowdrops. Oh, beautiful aren't they, they're just coming out. And that reminded me that, you know, even underneath everything's good. Yeah. And things are planned. Yeah. Good is the heart of all things. Good is the heart of everybody. Perfection. Thanks, Sue, love. Catherine, love. It's just uh, continuing what you've just said that me and Colin were driving on Lytham Front a few days ago and people that are not familiar with them it's such like it's known for in spring it's full of beautiful daffodils absolutely lovely and we were driving on and i said to colin i says oh i said look all daffodils are all coming up it's lovely it's going to be lovely soon and uh, i actually commented to you didn't i that People driving on, they might be full of all oh, what's going on with COVID, they might be worried, sick and everything. But when they're driving on or walking past all these lovely daffodils, do they see the daffodils that life's continuing, that, you know, everything's moving on and in a few weeks time we'll have all these beautiful daffodils? Or do they just drive past them and not see what's still happening, that life's continuing, that soon there is going to be light at the end of the tunnel and that even though everything's going on we've still got all this beauty that's around us and it's continuing you know so life's not come to a standstill it's not all doom and gloom we're surrounded by beauty if we just look at it if we just see it rather than just drive past it so basically i said we still need to be stopping and smelling the roses didn't i and I said, it's a shame that so many people Oh, sorry, can you hear me still? Yeah, I've pretty much done now. <laughs> I hope you got that. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely, love. Thank you. This is one of the reasons why we wanted to do this retreat now. It's because we really get a sense that many, many people are waiting for life either to go back to normal or to start up again. And it's like life has never stopped. You know, it, it is that, you know, so many people have, have almost put their lives on hold because of this pandemic. No, life's continuing. You're still alive. Don't put your life on hold. Wake up, see you're still alive and smell the roses, see the daffodils. I think one of the things we both mentioned to each other early on was the feeling we both used to get of loneliness and we could be surrounded by people but for some reason feel really, really lonely and, and separate. And, mm. and then there'd be times where we had been on our own completely physically, but felt so connected and so at peace. And I think that was one of the things I started to realize is that it looks like our experience or our feeling comes from outside. And we think there's things that we need to be okay. But actually the the feeling of connection doesn't come from outside of us the feeling of loneliness doesn't come from outside of us it comes from within us and it really struck me when we, we when we had that conversation like wow you got that too that that 
surrounded by loving family and friends and still this deep feeling of loneliness and disconnection. And I think we try and feel that in so many different ways. And but just to know that then some of my most connected moments have been when I've just been on, on my own, quiet somewhere. And I think looking, I remember on one of the retreats, one of the last retreats I ran with my old company, Nate Wellbeing, you shared um, about the, the, you know, we're, we're not connected to nature, we are nature. And I remember having this kind of bit of an aha moment of within the principles community, we've often spoken about look within, look within for the truth, look within for the answer. And I'd kind of heard that, I mean, this was about five years ago, this, this retreat, I'd kind of heard like, look within yourself, look within, almost within the, not the character, I knew there's something deep, but they was I see why when we look at nature, look at the perfection, look to the truth, it, that's looking within, not within this form, within the truth. And I remember just going, wow, well, how had I not seen that before? Truth is everywhere. It's all around us. The, the snowdrop suddenly became your teacher. The daffodil suddenly became your teacher. And I think that's the beautiful thing. And it is when we, our attention shifts from the personal, who we are, what we think we're capable of, um, what we think we're not capable of, the limits that we put on ourselves. Life isn't personal in that way. There's this, this divine intelligence. And like you're saying, life's still gone on. But there's a couple of times I've sat and I'm like, I wonder if the sheep outside your window have got any idea of what's going on around the world right now. They're still just walking along, eating the grass. They're just doing their thing. And then yesterday morning when we drove in, we um, were driving up, I can't remember the name of the road, we were driving up the road and I was like, hey, look at that. And there was a red kite. Oh, rather red kite. And we both just, we're just like in awe, like, wow, we're like, this is a really good sign for our retreat. Yeah. The red kite came in, but it just- it Made us feel good. But I just thought, how many red kites have I missed in my life? Because I'm, I'm like this, um, how am I doing? How am I feeling? And very personal, completely innocently. But how much do we miss? And how many times do we drive past a beautiful banking of flowers and not even see it? Like I said yesterday, when I drove back into the village I'd grown up in since I was three, I was like, this is a stunning village. Like, look at this, look at that. I was like, where have I been? I've not seen this village. And I think that's the thing we get to think again. We get to see again. We get to have new eyes. I think my greatest teacher personally has been the natural world. It was, it was through observing a, a jackdaw, I've mentioned this numerous times, through observing a jackdaw, as it glanced at me and I, I was looking at it, I realised it was a state of consciousness that could think, which then opened up my mind. I can't explain it. I, 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 I would, if I was to say what happened, it's just, it's just words. But to kind of come after it and try and put words to, to what I came to realise, I realised everything is endowed with this power of thought. Not just human beings. You know, so much of what I learned at school was that the idea that human beings think and animals work on instinct. Wow, what a disservice we've given to our brothers and sisters of different species and genuses and kingdoms. What a disservice we've done to, to the other beings on our planet. No, they're intelligent. Everything is intelligent. I remember being with my mate Ed, I don't think Ed's on here tonight, today. And we were doing some tree work. And on this particular day, I found this spider web and I'd looked at this spider web. I was just, I just in this moment, you know, Catherine, as you become aware of the snowdrops coming through and the daffodils coming through, I just became very aware of this cobweb. And I went and started looking at it. I couldn't be asked to work, I couldn't be asked to climb trees on this day. And anything that was a distraction was welcome. 
And I remember, I mean, I was a tree surgeon, so I, I was used to being aware of anchor points for ropes and so I could climb trees and I would always look at a tree when I still do it from to this day I look to trees for anchor points or how I'd reduce them where's the good points it's just something that keeps coming to my mind habitual thought I remember looking at this um this spider web and Ed came up to me and was like what are you looking at you effing blah 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 as Ed did I said, I'm looking at this dude. I said, look at this. And what had happened was this spider had made this, it had made this kind of horizontal web. But this web was like fabric, so tightly woven. It was like, it was like a stre stretched out fabric. It was pulled tight, anchored from all these different, different points on this hedge. So many anchor points, pulled tight. And in the middle, it was pulled tight down and it created like a funnel. And I watched an insect fall into it and then it, it was like oh well, i'm heading in this direction it ended up in this little funnel and this little spider ran out underneath went through the um the fabric bit it and then went round picked it out and wandered into the into the hedge with it i was blown away this spider was that big it wasn't much bigger than the end of my pen there it had it had utilized its surroundings it was aware of its surroundings and it used its surroundings consciously to create its its insect catching device and i just said ed look at this and then ed said something he went I said, look at it. I said, look, it's got all these anchor points, different tensions. Look at all these different tensions it's using. And I said, it's made this using its surroundings. It's, it's in the moment. It's made decisions. It's a genius. And he went, Ed just went, it's a tiny physicist. I'm thinking, yeah, like a physicist would look at the contours of the land, uh, figure out how to build a bridge over a gap physicist a mathemat uh, um, a person of mathematics would figure it out what angles do we need it's going to be weight distribution it would need to figure it out it would need to use its intellect and i realized that's what the spider's doing it's a genius thought thought within a spider Thought, in the moment, decision-making, genius. And when I looked down the hedge, there were other webs. They weren't all identical because they weren't built at the same place in the hedge. So the hedge head was different. So, of course, it had to build a different, different web. This is what spiders do. This is how they survive. They build a web and they, that, this is what they're built to do. And then the same day we found these, um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with them, elephant hawk moth caterpillars. Oh, look them up. Look up hawk moth caterpillar snake on Google when you get a chance. You will see that genius does not, it, intelligence is not a personal thing. It precedes, it comes before, it precedes is the right word, it precedes us we're made from it we're made from intelligence you can't measure intelligence we create these ideas of a b c d e f unclassified i think it's one to nine now we try and grade people's intelligence you can't you can't you cannot measure intelligence I think it was Einstein said, if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree or spend its whole life thinking it's stupid. I looked into that. There's a fish called the climbing gun army. There's a fish called the snakehead fish, I think it is. And there's another one that actually actively climb out and climb trees. So even that can't be stopped. Even that is genius. But if you start to look to nature, it's like, you start to get a sense of something bigger than the ego. And humanity is nature. It's a lost aspect of nature. It's, a, it's an aspect of nature that has 
got so entrenched in its intellect, it's forgotten its, its divine connection to the whole. It's forgotten its divinity. And in doing so, it's created a separation which creates suffering. I stopped, I stopped killing trees, but I stopped doing tree work when I realized this about nature. Trees are conscious thinking beings. They're just like us. They do not have a brain. Yet they're conscious. They think. They make decisions. They communicate. They are aware. Whenever I've reduced a tree, it's, it's been aware and it has subsequently responded. If I took off, say, 40 years growth, it could get back that 40 years growth in about seven years. It is aware, knows what to do. The intelligence, the knowledge, the same as ours. Our knowledge comes from somewhere. Because we've lived in a, in a world which, in a, in a scientific paradigm, materialist worldview, we assume that our knowledge comes from the brain how can the knowledge come from the brain? It can come into the brain. How can it come from it? Trees don't have brains, yet they are conscious, they are aware. They, there's beautiful experiments shown that they've injected two trees next to each other of different species. They injected one with a radioactive isotope and they covered up the tree next to it. Now the reason why they did that was the one which has been injected with a radioactive isotope is open to the sunlight and it is capable of photosynthesis to generate glucose and to feed itself and give itself energy for growth. Now the one which they didn't inject, which is just a normal tree, which has just been covered over, cannot photosynthesize. It can't get the sunlight. When they measured the trees, both trees were equal in photosynthesis production. And we're like, how is this happening? It didn't take them long to realize that the tree, the tree that was uncovered, when they measured it, when they measured, oh sorry, my apologies, when they measured the tree which was covered, it had this radioactive isotope in it. The tree that was uncovered fed and helped the one that was struggling. There was awareness. There was kindness. There was love. If you ever step back and look at a natural woodland, you will see that they're, they're not outcompeting one another. This is, this is an outdated idea that society is built on, that nature is competition. Nature is not competition. It's not competition. Totally cooperative. On a personal level, we could go, oh, it is competitive. You know, foxes eat, foxes eat rabbits. That's not very nice. There's more rabbits than there is foxes. There's more grass than there is rabbits. Nature is a cooperative state. And if you ever look at a woodland, you'll see a, a natural woodland that hasn't been faffed around with humanity. You'll see it's shaped. You'll see it's shaped like that. So that the wind can come in like a dome tent. These trees here on the edge, they put their leaves out on the edge they get equal amount of sunlight exposure to the ones in the middle, but they only have, they only have uh, foliage on the top. These trees are what we call wind firm in forestry. In, in forestry, we call them wind firm because they have always been exposed to the wind. They have deeper, higher roots. They have deeper, stronger root systems than the ones in the middle. The ones in the middle only have very small root systems, which is why you'll see if anybody ever takes out the edge rows of a tree, uh, a woodland, you'll see they all blow over in the middle. 
It's because they're not wind firm. They've never had to be because the, they have been a community and they've been supported by one another. It's only when mankind comes in and takes down the edge trees, it destroys the whole woodland because they were built on cooperation. Their society was built on cooperation, not competition. Some people might go, oh, but Douglas firs, they grow massive, you know, they outcompete. No, that's, that's their species, that's what they do. You know, Scandinavians are generally really tall people. It's not their fault, it's just the way they're, they're genetically built. You know, it, all this takes awareness. All this is a state of awareness. You walk through a woodland and look up. Try and see if you can see two trees that actually touch one another. They grow around one another. Sometimes they come within inches. Very, very rarely did I ever cut a tree or work on a tree that was touching another tree. They came very close. So close. Sometimes they came to like within that close of each other. But they didn't touch. Awareness, capable of making decisions, no brain, we're not talking about brain here, we're talking about the, f the force that energizes life, it's deeply intelligent and I remember being, forgive me for people who've heard me mention this before but I remember when I was a tree surgeon, I remember pulling a thorn out of my hand. I've had thousands of thorns. I've had them stuck in my arteries and bleeding like hell through my work. But I remember pulling this thorn out of my hand and all of a sudden, for no good reason, into my mind came, <clears throat> why? The question, why do plants have thorns? I was like, well, <laughs> stood there having a conversation with myself well because to protect them You're like, how does that work next question was how does that work well I feel the thorn going into my skin it hurts so I leave the plant alone the next question that came into my mind was but how does it work? I remember thinking back to my school days and still answer this, I'm like, okay, well, I have a nervous system. And, and when my skin gets punctured, it irritates my nervous system. It sends a message to my brain. I'm aware of this message. I, I don't want to bother the plant. The next question, was a lot more difficult to answer. But how does the plant kingdom have awareness of the animal kingdom's nervous system? Because without the nervous system, the thorn is totally useless. It only works because of the nervous system. Without the nervous system, the thorn has no value. It doesn't do a thing. baffled me. I couldn't answer that question. It took me, I spent weeks thinking about it. It played on my mind a lot. How does the plant kingdom know about the animal nervous system? The plant kingdom doesn't have a nervous system attached to a brain, so it's not like it could replicate something within itself to produce this thorn. It's not looking at itself, its own model, to kind of go, well, animals are the same as us do that no it doesn't have a brain it doesn't have a nervous system animals have brains and nervous systems and the thorn is useless without without the nervous system in the interaction and then one day for no good reason i don't even know if i was thinking about it at the time what came into my mind is the plant doesn't know about the nervous system I didn't know about the nervous system until I learned it at school. I have one. 
But what creates the plant? Creates the animal. The intelligence doesn't lie in the plant, it lies in that that creates. It lies in the knowledge before creation. And once you start to open up your eyes to this, you start to see this everywhere, this deep knowledge that exists at the heart of all things. It's, I brought this little plant in because <coughs> I just didn't want him getting lonely. I thought he could come and sit with us for a wee bit. But you see, it's, it's green. That's chlorophyll. Built into the, each chlorophyll cell is the knowledge of the sun, sunlight. Without sunlight, there's no need for chlorophyll. The sun's 92 million miles away from Earth. It's never touched the Earth. The Earth's never touched the sun. This plant's never come in contact with the sun and gone, oh, that's how you work. It's 92 million miles away. But the knowledge between the sun and the sun, it doesn't work on distance. It doesn't know distance. Nature has been one of my greatest teachers. The more I've looked into nature and the more that I've seen the magic and the mystery and the divinity and the perfection that is nature. Nature does not create imperfect things. Never. There's no such thing as a wrong tree, a wrong flower, a wrong insect, a wrong fish doesn't create nature does not create imperfection it only creates total perfection given what is going on and we are nature we're not a mistake we are anything but imperfect we are perfect every single one of us is totally perfect we just don't know it because we believe something different. The idea of imperfection is a thought, nothing more. When that thought gets quiet, the experience gets quiet. We're built to be here. We're built to take life. We're built to experience. We're built to ultimately wake up. Wake up to our true nature our true nature to wake up and realize we are perfect we are whole we are not broken we are not damaged this is all thought this is all memories we carry through time this is all ego this is an illusion of self this is who we think we are we've ne we, when we were born we weren't born with an idea of who we thought we were We, but yet there we were before we created a version of ourselves who we thought we were there we were there we were still is here now but there we were is confusing itself for this is me this is who i am i am this i'm depressed i'm anxious i'm a warrior i'm a blah 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 no they're temporary momentary experiences they're things that come and go Feelings, thoughts, ideas, they come and go. Oh, I'm Dave Ellery, I'm a tree surgeon. Oh, no, I'm not. But I'm still here. You start to realise this, you start to wake up and realise that what we call reality is our experience. We think we walk through reality because we think reality exists outside of ourselves. We think we walk through or move through reality. No, reality is moving through us, each of us, differently, expressing itself differently. This is why everybody sees a different world. This is why people argue. This is why people like different things. That's why we have different religions, different political parties, different artwork. People like different films because we're all seeing different realities. Reality is not real ultimately reality is not real the reality that we perceive is illusory 
The true reality resides at heart, the behind, the essence, the you that doesn't go anywhere, the you that's aware continuously. That's the real us. That's the essence of life. That's where all knowledge comes from. That force of life that animates the being, the being, the being's body will die. When it dies, the animating force has left. It no longer resides within the physical. Call that death. So what's the difference between life and death? It has to be an energetic expression. The living part, the bit you cannot weigh, measure, cut, scar. Can't measure it. Yet here we all are, experiencing via it, living life in its normality, in its boringness, in its beauty, in its mundaneness, in its fearfulness. All these are temporary experiences, but we identify with them and think that's who we are. No, 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 no. No, that's not who anybody is. If you were that, you'd be that all the time. Why does it come and go? People with depression, when you wake up in the morning, are you depressed? First thing in the morning, when you first wake up, or is there a sense of peace before you start thinking? Right? Yeah. Before we start thinking and identifying with the thoughts. The false self. The illusion of self, the ego, the intellect. It's funny, I remember um, there's been a few times we've done webinars and you've spoken about, I've said today, to talk about nature, like speak about that. It's, it's, it's changed the way I understood the principles, it's changed the way I understand myself and there's been times when people are, why is he talking about trees? Why is he talking about chlorophyll cells? And we, we think that, that the principles can seem like it's, it's some kind of human psychology. And what I've loved is hearing Sid spoke about these principles as universal principles. He knew it, it was total. He knew it wasn't just human. But he could speak to human beings and, and that's fine and, and, and we can talk about it in a practical way. But I have loved hearing about that intelligence that spans all life. The intelligence between the chlorophyll cell and the sun. The intelligence between the thorn and the nervous system. I'm like, I, things that had never occurred to me. I was kind of, in some ways I got too caught up with what insights have I had? What have I realised? And they're beautiful and it's amazing and I love that we get to have insight and things that really help us in our, in our personal life. But I think what I've really enjoyed exploring more is the before, is that divine energy that comes before. Because otherwise I was still looking at a character. My character saw this, my character realized this and, and that's great and it's not that we don't do that. I love hearing and sharing insight. But I've also really enjoyed expanding my mind and like just recently we've been watching some different documentaries and programs and i'm starting to question so many of my firmly held beliefs that were so invisible like it's just that's just how life is or that's just how it works and i'm like i don't even know that's true i've been told it and the people that tell me things seem to really be sure of themselves but is that true and I've loved the feeling of expanse when I start to recognize I don't know. I really don't know a lot of things. I believe a lot of things. And when we come from that space, it feels like we get to experience more of that before that what we, we are. Like Catherine said earlier, I feel like I'm listening from within. I'm not listening from my personality like that space within us that hears this, that like, I think it was uh, another, I think it was Cap that said earlier, I can't put this into words. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even want to, 
but there's something that feels different. And that's the, the beauty of this. We don't have to intellectually know what we've heard because a shift in consciousness often doesn't come with words. And like I had, I spoke about this a bit at community group, but I had three days last week or beginning of this week where I felt really flat, just empty. I, I couldn't really, I just kept saying, I've got, I've got nothing. I can't, I can't give anything. I can't interact. It, I'm just, I was going through the motions and like on the second day, I was like, oh wow, I still, I'm still like this. Okay. So I got on, carried on the motions and, and I, and, and I think when in that space, it's like loads of thoughts can kind of bombard and insecurities and worries and, and it was all just like noise. There's a lot of noise. And like Sue described, it's almost like day four, I popped out of it. I've no idea why. No idea. Wow, look at life and suddenly engaging in a completely different way, suddenly having much more of me to offer other people. And but I'm kind of grateful for those three days of just it was almost numbness. I hadn't got anything. And I think without, like, if that's the sort of feeling I would have got as a teenager, about, oh my goodness, I'm going down. Oh my God, this really means something about me. There's something wrong with me. Whereas I think people think, well, you learn about this understanding, then you never have those kind of experiences. But I love that we, we can go through them with understanding mm-hmm. and not, not have to freak out so much and think there's something wrong with me. You're just aware that's just what's showing up. That's what experience is bringing to life right now. You don't have to dissect it and analyze it or and I think that's where you start to see more and more like the impersonal nature of this I didn't choose to have that experience I don't know I don't even know what was going on but there seems to be a lot of gratitude built into all experience now I often describe it as I went from only wanting to experience this section of life, like the good stuff and all the other stuff used to terrify me and freak me out to it being like suddenly all feelings were allowed and on the table. Experience was up for grabs, not wrong, not right. And I think it's nice, like the examples of the the snowdrops and the daffodils, like it could seem like the, the earth was kind of dead over winter and then you've got no idea all the stuff that's going on underneath and then suddenly we get to see spring comes and all of this all of this new life and I think sometimes with ourselves it might be that we go into these different places and there's there's growth and there's learning and it might seem dark but in that same way what's going to be born from it what's going to be birthed from it and I think if we can gain respect for life and the intelligence that exists, a bit like I said yesterday with when I felt like I had a big decision, someone was like, oh, it's not on me to have to make that. I'm going to hand that over to the intelligence of life that creates everything. In time. I don't have to figure this out with my little intellect. I don't have to do this. And I think I saw my sister pop on the screen, but I remember with her two kids, um, the older one used to always want to kind of parent the younger one. And she'd always be like, you're not allowed to do that. Daddy says this. And she used to suck her thumb. And I remember this one time she was going, you're not allowed to suck your thumb. You're not, you're, you're going to get teeth like a llama. She was going on and on at her. And I just stopped her for a moment and I just said, it's not your job to parent her you can it's not your job you don't have to do it you, you're not her parent she went oh all right then carried on with a, a day and it was almost like you could see the relief of you don't have to try and parent your little sister that's not your job and i feel like sometimes now in life i get to realize oh it's not my job to try and figure that out it's not my job to try and live me i will be lived life will happen and there's this intelligence to it. Mm. 
And I think I used to think there's an intelligence and there's this universal mind when life was showing up in a really beautiful way. Then I could see the intelligence and the beauty. But then I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm not in the principles today if I'm having a bad mood. There's no intelligence in that. I'm, I'm doing, not in my spiritual self. I'm doing it wrong. This isn't universal mind. I somehow thought there was two powers. There was two. And I've grown in respect for, for all feeling, all experience. And there, there isn't that sense of need or desire to have a certain type of experience all the time. Which in its own way creates less fear. And it is nice to have people around who yeah. can kind of have a similar understanding. Like we are blessed with that. And I'm so grateful that when I first came to this, there was a community down in Colchester where we used to meet up and have potlucks and, and talk about what we were seeing. And you'd be like, oh yeah, I've forgotten it again. A bit like Margaret and Kendra are saying, like it's so nice to have the reminders. And I think that's why we've enjoyed doing community groups and just for when people first come to this, like it can, you can get a sense of it and you, you feel expansive and then you kind of get lost in your thinking again. You're, oh, it doesn't work. This isn't true. And just to have that reminder again, I know we all get caught up. That's it working perfectly. Isn't Whatever it? we think we experience. Experiences, it looks like experience is handed to us and we're subject to it. It's almost like, I, I remember think, describing it as like, our being on earth is an irrelevance. Our being there to witness it is an irrelevance to the experience actually being created. Oh no, the experience is created out there and we are literally, we are given it. That's how the majority of humanity exists. They feel affected by the world, finances, or the cultures, weather, time. You know, we feel so affected by our world but if the world could truly create an experience would it not be true that we would all experience that experience the same experience would that not be the true reality if reality existed outside of ourselves and we we would all see the same reality because it would be reality surely that would make sense surely but the fact that we can go to the same place and some of us enjoy it and some of us don't and we could pick up a menu, we all pick something different off a menu. And you, you then you look at it and you look at this logically. You realise the only reason why we actually have language, the reason why we even speak, is because we all live in a separate reality. If, we, if reality existed outside of our being, there'd be nothing to talk about. We'd just know. Language was created so one world could communicate with the next world, who could communicate with the next world, who could communicate with the next world. I can communicate my reality with Jenny and Jenny can communicate her reality with me. Language, something we use every day. It's absolute evidence that we're all living in a different reality. There'd be no need for language if it wasn't for different realities. Um, you, sorry, sweetheart. I was going to say, you can see also that there's not only all of us experiencing different realities, we experience different realities throughout the day. Like, we can go to a place one day and absolutely love it and think it's amazing and it's filling our soul, and another day it's like it doesn't do anything for us. Like, I remember like being out in South Africa the first time, just being like, it was just so, everything was just so vibrant and beautiful and amazing. And the next time, almost I wanted it to be the same as the first time. So then I wasn't even enjoying it. Like I was in the same country, the same beaches, same incredible wildlife. And then I caught myself. You're trying to recreate the trip you had six, seven months ago. Like. Create new memories. But it was, and I think I said it to you and you're like, let's make some new memories. Let's go to some new places. That's, but you can see how, reality continually changes by thought so it's not only that we're we're all living in our own thought created realities our realities change moment to moment to moment things are being born and dying and like a respect for that we're not fixed in who we think we are we're this fluid potential mm. we're different characters and I remember probably a few years after coming across the principles, um, going to hang out with my sister and some of her friends. 
And um, on the way back down, I just went, oh my goodness, I was, I was myself around everyone. And she's like, oh God, yeah. Because normally around her friends, I'd have been quite a bit reserved and th those people would have made me feel reserved. But for whatever reason, I didn't have that thought. I didn't have that belief. And I just had this incredible evening with everyone. Just present. Not on my mind. I, I, I'm not a full-time job to myself. I don't have to do it. And none of us do. That intelligence that was it within the natural world is us. We are the natural world. And I think that's something that we can see again and again and again. Like this isn't about believing anything Dave or I say or anyone else on the call says. This isn't about buying into a new belief system. In fact, please don't. Yeah, this is about <laughs> see if this rings true for yourself and then go away and, and I believe it's self-proving. I believe that what we're pointed to is self-proving and evident because it's true. The truth will reveal itself to us. Mary. Hi, um, I was just thinking about what you were saying about, about um, you know, reality and how it feels. Um, 18 months ago, I lost my daughter to cancer. And um, while she was in the hospice, and I, I knew she was dying, I mean, it was obvious, um, she was sort of dozing off and falling asleep. And I went into a really quiet place, even though I was in a what sort of a place of despair. Um, can, I went into this Mary, really... Just, pause. just one second, I can, there's some other microphone on. Sorry, Mary, love, another microphone kicked in and I really wanted to hear what you had to say. Okay. Um, I, went to, I was in a place of despair, but I went somewhere really quiet. Yeah. And in that moment, um, I just felt so peaceful and this feeling of um, gratitude for having had my daughter in my life came over me. And I just felt so much love for her, even though I was in a place where normally you would experience despair. It was just beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Mary. Okay. The other part was that after she died, um, a lot of people were saying, oh, it must be terrible for you. It must be terrible for you. But because of that feeling, it seemed to carry me through. And grief wasn't like I was expecting it. I remember you saying, Mary, when we had a, our, one of our retreats in Grasmere and you came. Beautiful retreat. I love that retreat. Yeah. I remember you saying, my daughter's been given a um, diagnosis of this cancer and she hasn't got long left. And I remember you describing her as an inspiration she went out and truly started to live yeah i remember you saying that she went out and she started to live she started to do all the things that she wanted to do 
I remember that hitting me really hard. It's like, how often do we not do all the things we truly want to do with this idea we're going to live forever? In this physical form, we're going to be here forever. I've got all the time in the world. No, we don't. Yeah. One of the things that happened towards the very end, um, I wasn't there, but on the morning of the day that she died, she said to the doctor, I've had enough now, thank you. Can you give me something to sleep, basically, because she'd got the, the cancer had gone into her lungs and she couldn't breathe. So she was sleeping, sat up for a fortnight, just sort of dozing off because she was frightened to lay back in case she fell asleep because she thought if she fell asleep, she'd never wake up, which is what actually happened in eventually. But she said to the doctor, I've had enough now. And he said, I can't give you anything to kill you. He thought she wanted something to finish her off. And she said, no, I just want something to help me sleep. And he said to her, you do know that this might be the last medication I ever give you. And she said, yes, I know that. And with that, she laid back on the pillows. I believe, I don't know, I wasn't there. And just calmed down. Her breathing relaxed and she just quietly fell out of this life. Peacefully. And my son was there and my brother-in-law, and my son-in-law was there with her at the time. And they said it was so peaceful that she just decided that she'd bounce back for the last time. Because we used to call her the one that bounced back. Every time she was ill, she, she just bounced back up again. But each time she didn't bounce quite so high. And the night before she died, I was with her. And she, I, I used to be the one that put her to bed. We used to, we basically three of us did shifts. So I was on the afternoon evening shift and I was the one that put her to bed and she couldn't stand up long enough for me to take her clothes off and get her pajamas on. And I think at that point I saw the look on her face as she realized that she wasn't going to bounce back after this. This was like the end of the game, you know, and it wasn't at all surprising that the next day she decided if she couldn't bounce back and she couldn't enjoy her life, she wasn't going to play anymore. And I think that's what happened. She decided enough was enough. So in some ways, I was expecting that the grieving was going to take a certain form. And it didn't. It didn't. Every time I think about it now, and there's this huge grin keeps going on my face because she was such a character. She was a lovely girl. And I'm not saying that just because she was my daughter because a lot of other people have said the same. She was incredible. But the, one of the comments that she made was when you said, you know, living life to the full, she said, I've been asking for all sorts of things in my life, she said, and cancer's given me it all. She said, unfortunately, it gave me cancer as well. <laughs> but she got everything she wanted, which I find is amazing. It's a privilege, isn't it? Mm. Mary, thank you so much, love. Thank you so much for your time and so much love to you and your daughter. Go. Go. Can I just say to Mary, Mary, you inspired us when you came to the Dickon meeting and you told us about your daughter. And during that Dickon meeting, we all fell in love with you. <laughs> Big style. <laughs> One of the things that I remember so much about you is you sat there in your little seat and said, Do you know, I even love my feet today. Oh, yeah. Do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Mary fell in love with her feet at the, when Dick and came to speak. Well, I've fallen out of love with them again. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, Mary, the, the, leg the legacy of, of the, that you have of your daughter is what's going to help other people live. Absolutely, Mary. Fully. And you're such an inspiration. You're such a lovely, lovely person. Oh, oh God, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> you to have you at home, Mum. Okay, to have you back. Love you, Mary. Love you, Mary. Thank you. Right. Em, you've got your hand up, love. We've got about 10 minutes before break time. Hi, guys. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, love. Um, I haven't got my um, camera on just yet. I've just been cleaning, so bear with me. But um, Cleaning what? Naked? Well, Dave, I, I'm sure I wouldn't be cleaning naked, darling, but <laughs> Thanks for look for things that like would be a shock. Um, anyway, going back to Mary, how beautiful and wow, that's all I can say. And thank you for sharing that. But um, it really touched my heart because on our last retreat we had, I was two days into just losing my mum. And uh, oh, my God, I mean, it's like this emotion has come over me and I thought I was handling it all right but that's our thoughts come in and out but what I'm saying is what Mary said really resonated with me and that's exactly how I experienced my mum's passing and the leading up to losing my mum uh so we're now a couple of months into it and grief has really been a very very different experience for me this time round. Uh, I think people think I'm almost having a nervous breakdown. I think they're waiting for this big, I don't know, episode, shall we say. But it, I don't honestly feel it's going to happen <laughs> because since coming across the principles, I see life and death very differently and the fact that it's all one and universal. So the whole fear of death, shall we say, um, is diminished in this moment for me. Obviously, I miss her physical form. I miss that every day. But I, I don't fear. I don't fear it. I don't fear. I'm just, and I'm experiencing whatever comes my way in each moment. Like today, I mean, I, I was quite happy to speak. Then, of course, Lisa and your mum said a bit that started me off. And I was like, oh, no, guys, how can you do that? I'm now like welling up and in tears. <laughs> and uh, then you said, Emma, it's your time to talk. I was like, no, I'm not ready. But, you know, that moment's passed. That's a prime example. I was literally just about, if I wanted to get heavy into what I was experiencing in that moment, I would have literally been in a right mess. But it's passed. And here we are now. And now I'm, I've got the news that my 39 year old sister, possibly on Monday or tomorrow's D-Day, could have um, breast cancer. So that's obviously brought up a lot of feelings. And people keep asking me, you know, how are you going to deal with that? Well, I don't know. Until that moment comes. And then we'll deal with it. But what I'm trying to point point everyone to is like, I love this conversation. And knowing what I know has really made me experience good times and bad times with almost grace and appreciation. Oh. 
and a lot of presence by the sounds end. Exactly. What I really hear in that is a real gift for people. What you just said there is a real gift for people. How will you deal with it? I don't know. I don't hear you saying, I'm going to be like this, I'm going to be like that. I hear you say, I don't know. Mm. I don't know is truest realization about the future. But no. What's it going to be like? I don't know. How are you going to deal with it? I don't know. I'll deal with it however I deal with it in the moment. I think, I think what you described there um, is something for people to really become aware of. You know, trying to figure out the future is a futile thing. It doesn't exist. It's just a ball of imagination is the future. It only exists as a thought. It doesn't exist as a thing or a, or a place. It's a thought. And I think when you, when you say that, it's like, how will you deal with the future? I don't know. I don't know. You are not trying to figure it out. You're not lost in the future. You are present in the moment with, I don't know. And if, if anybody is struggling with any future events that they're worried about, there's a real lesson from them there for people. I don't know. I'll deal with it however it comes to me in the moment. I think also in what Mary said, it wasn't what she expected. Mm. And completely had a moment where you thought you'd be in despair and actually you're filled with peace and gratitude. And I think that's both of you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us all. Both of you beautiful. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Did you do that, Mary? That's how I dealt with it. Oh, beautiful love. That's the painting of my daughter. Which I thought was really good. <laughs> and I don't care whether anybody else likes it or not. Well, I haven't seen her, so I couldn't say. Well, it, it looks very much, it's got the energy of her. I love it then. Yeah. I love it's it. a pretty good likeness, but it's also got the energy of her. Oh. Bless you both. <laughs> got about five more minutes. Does anybody else? Oh, want did to, you want to say did something? Did you say something, Paul? Unmute yourself, Marit. Morning, everyone. Um, I'll try to say thank you to the two, to Mary and Emma there. Like, your words were beautiful and I had us in tears, which was a, a, a odd feeling to have to be sharing with, like, with everyone on screen. I would, I would have shied away and turned my camera off, but your brave words have helped me to do that. Um, and... It's an insight that I've had recently. Um, suffered with drug addiction and um, mental issues for a long time, and introduced to the um, to the the three principles back in November. Um, and um, and what I've, I fell off the wagon a couple of weeks ago, and it, it tore us away from everything that I love and everything I've kind of opened up to and it's it's pulled us away from a, a part of my life that's that previously would have it would have ruined following months and what I've learned is a feeling that comes up inside an emotion doesn't have to lead to doesn't have to lead us down the same path a feeling doesn't have to take me down the same journey or the same destination um and that was it, that, that uh, every experience is new, as long as I stay in touch with these three principles, as long as I stay in touch with communities like this, it allows me to, to, to see things with, through a child's eyes. Um, so that's all I want to share, thank you. A child's eyes, do you mean with freshness? Without, without, pre, without prejudice and prejudgment? 
yeah, without 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 the set of predetermined um, rules and laws that my ego would have built into me, um, and my ego is kind of meeting its match now. I'm starting to see through it, certainly quicker than I have been, and I'm, I'm able to drop it a bit quicker, um, which has been lovely. And yesterday was. A perfect day, which led to like some just amazing events last night, and um, yeah, I'll maybe share that another time. Thank you, mate. Thank you. So we're going to have a fifteen minutes break, and we'll be back with Lisa, hopefully with fantastic internet. Yeah, um, Lisa, Meta, make sure Lisa's got good internet because yours was terrible. It's not brilliant. It's doing all right today. It's doing, it's doing all right. 